Hello and welcome to this episode of In the Principal's Office and this is season two. My name is Nicholas Odiambo and I am the school principal of Riruta Jubilee Academy from Nairobi, Kenya. On behalf of Global School Leaders, I'm delighted to be your hosts today. Uh, usually being called to the principal's office is a scary prospect. But I hope through this series, we are able to, to just change that. Right, I'm honored to have a writer, an educator, and activist with me today. Please join me in welcoming Ranjinda Hamidi, Afghanistan's former Minister of Education and the nation's first female to hold this esteemed position. I'm eager to learn about her journey and get her thoughts on the kinds of leadership required for schools today. Ms. Hamidi, welcome to the show. We are delighted to have you join us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me join uh, or call, be called to the principal's office for the first time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> for the, I, I like the fact, the fact that you said for the first time in your life. <laughs> I was always a good student. So I always was forced to do things right. And uh, I think part of that uh, just never prompted me to go to the principal's office because the idea is that only students who got, got in trouble visited mm -hmm. the principal's office. I wish we could change that notion to make the principal's office as a space of comfort and celebration and uh, honoring good behavior and good good everything. So yeah, in my experience, it was always the bad kids who went to the principal's office, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. It's incredible to speak to you from Kenya. Here's my first question for you. Given that you are in the principal's office, I wanted to hear about your relationship with your school principal when you're young. Now that you said you have never been called to the principal's office, uh, then what are the memories that you have? You know, it's a very, very interesting because two principals um, pop in my head. And it's interesting that they were on the two opposite ends of the pole. One is my very, very first grade uh, principal of the school, uh, we were Afghan refugees living in Pakistan. Uh, and this is 1984, 83, 84-ish. Um, and we were enrolled in a private school because as Afghan refugees living in a different country, we were not authorized and allowed to be enrolled in the public school systems of Pakistan. So my father had to and could only enroll us in a private school. But a private school always you know, operates on um, charging fees. And my dad being a refugee man, um, payment systems in those times, you know, you didn't have a bank account where your payment came on time. So sometimes if the salary was stalled or delayed, there would be no money on time to pay the school fee on the day that it was due. And I remember as a little, little tiny kid, first grader, for seven to eight days consistently, the school principal would stand inside outside of the school door with a stick in her hand. And for every day that our fee was delayed, we would get a beating on our hand. And eventually, of course, my father paid and that's why we were allowed to continue to be enrolled in that school. But in retrospect, when I think about that, <laughs> a school principal being so cruel to hit little kids because of a decision that the parents who were going through a financial struggle as refugees in that country, like there was no, there was no humanity to understand where we as a family were coming from, yet it was normal to penalize children uh, in the manner, a humiliating manner in which we were. And you fast forward to my second experience with a school principal in my high school in Arlington, Virginia and USA. Um, our high school principal was a woman um, who I loved and respected and, and, and she did, it was a mutual thing. The reason I got to know her is because 
my friends and I were very, very engaged in our extracurricular activities, including painting murals because I was good in art uh, to getting good grades and honors. And so even though I never got called to the principal's office, so I don't remember seeing Dr. Jawadi's office, but I always remember how she would acknowledge me and my friends in the hallways, in the mornings, in the afternoons, and students, my classmates knew that we that I had a good relationship with my school principal. And that kind of boosted my confidence as a 12th grade student who was on, you know, almost graduating. Um, it, it felt good to know that, you know, my principal recognizes me. And so wow. the contrast between that yeah. in first grade to that in 12th grade, um, it's incredible that we human beings, we remember both the extreme negative, but also the extreme positive stories mm -hmm. and relationships that we build as students with our administrators, our teachers, and more importantly, with our principals of our schools. Wow. Thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, I've read about your journey so far. You've championed the course for education for decades. You've worked to address critical challenges like dropout rates and access to basic education. You've also worked tirelessly through a, a global pandemic. And all this is in a society that's had turbulent years. Mr. Media, I'm just curious to know where this journey began and where does your passion come from? <laughs> well, thank you for those uh, kind words. Um, my journey with education really began with uh, being challenged personally when my daughter uh, turned six and I was living in Afghanistan in Kandahar uh, specifically. And I, as a, as, a, as a mother of a girl child um, in a society and in an environment where it was very, very challenging for girls to get educated, but particularly get quality education, um, I felt the responsibility to either take my my daughter out of the country, which means you know bring her back or take her back to my adopted home of America and enable her to go and continue schooling, or if I wanted to stay in Afghanistan, I was I was on the search to find quality education. After searching, I found that the level of quality that I was looking at didn't exist. So. Being the activist that I am, <laughs> people call me that I'm an activist. I don't ever think of myself as an activist. I just do things because women, you know, globally, when we see things don't exist, we make it happen when we can. Um, so I, with the help of my good friend, who was the thinker behind the idea, um, I started or, you know, my friend's idea turned into the first international school registered officially with the government of Afghanistan in 2017. Uh, we registered uh, our school and started the international school with a curriculum that we brought from outside uh, with international standards, but then inserted the Afghan values and principles and the language that we wanted to teach the children uh, to create a model of a success and a model of quality education that we didn't see, um, or that we 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 did not see, um, you know, available. And before I knew it, my daughter did become the very first student in that school, starting with her first grade. Um, and before long, we became the most popular school with a wait list of students and families wanting to send their children to us. Pandemic hit, um, and we were forced to shut down as schools were globally. Um, and within a month, not having the technical knowledge of how do you transform a physical classroom or a physical school to a virtual school uh, was really a challenge. But um, collectively, myself and the founder and the uh, teachers, um, all the administrators in the school, we collectively accepted to take the challenge and try, uh, try this virtual schooling. And um, within a month, we actually succeeded. Um, 
so Sir Nicholas, I received a call uh, from the president's office and uh, I was sure that he was going to talk about our model of how we so quickly and so successfully transformed from a physical school setting to a virtual school setting. Um, and I was excited to talk to him about that. And we did, we did talk a lot about the type of education we were offering at our school that differed from the variety, you know, from the thousands of schools and the, the, the school systems, the, the school system that was providing education for Afghan kids. And at the end of that call, he proposed that um, if I could join his cabinet as minister of education. Um, of course, I did not jump on to the opportunity because this is not something I wanted to do. It was not my ambition to join politics. Um, I never thought of joining politics. Um, but over a week's time of going back and forth and discussing, ultimately, one thing, one important thing made me make my decision to join, which was the president. The president challenged me, he said, you moved from Kandahar to Kabul and you invested and started in this educational journey opportunity for your own daughter and the, you know, the, the other kids that you are beautifully educating through this endeavor. He said, I know that you cannot replicate Mizan International School for the entire country um, through the Ministry of Education, but, but do you not want to give what you gave your daughter to the millions of children in Af of Afghanistan? And as a mother, as women, as educators, wow. um, it's difficult to turn that kind of a call down. And uh, for me, my vision in joining politics was not to serve as a politician, but to really take the challenge on and try to um, technicalize, if I may, uh, the Ministry of Education, the service of education, whose primary focus should have been children, but unfortunately, like in many other countries around the globe, uh, politics overtake the education of children, which is a disservice that we as adults uh, do to, to our future generations. And so I was, I was hoping that I could help in starting a little bit of the transformation needed for uh, transforming the ministry from politics focused to more a service focused institution. But of course, um, my journey was short. And uh, now for the past two plus years, the country has a completely different system and it's, uh, it's devastating as it is, but what can we say? This is what politics do, unfortunately. I agree with you. Thank you for for sharing. It's inspiring to hear about your journey, a journey that called for a unique kind of leadership. Ms. Midi, can you tell us more about the role school principal can play in education change? As a former minister of education, what role did you see them play in achieving education goals? Mm. You know, that's a very tough question, actually, um, because I think as in, as policymakers and as um, you know, leading institutions, leaders, um, we do, I, I recognize that we do put a lot of burden on the school principals, um, particularly in my country, I noticed, but I'm sure I'm probably not wrong to assume that that's the case in, on, in, in most countries in the world. Um, we expect a lot from our principals without really investing in giving the platform and the space for principals to be in direct communication or conversation with leadership, you know, politicians or, or, or administrators at the policy level uh, to, in, to be engaged in the transformation of education. Again, connecting to the fact that most nations don't allocate enough budgets to, to education uh, ministries is how you know, the, the, the principal's job is to creatively engage the community of parents or the community leaders in which the school is situated to involve the community to the best of its ability to empower the school and empower the, the learning experience of the school. You know, more and more, I'm seeing 
how much untapped resources exist in our communities that because of our mindset of treating the school as this building with boundaries, right? The traditional model of a school building, mm -hmm. it's a school with a wall maybe around it and the principal and then the high, you know, the all the elements below the principal. And we only utilize that structure for engagement or knowledge building or knowledge information sharing with students. In my head, I'm thinking creatively in communities where there's always a shortage of teachers and we always have shortage of teachers and I'm sure you and your school are probably faced with that too. Imagine a principal creating such a warm network of community leaders, members, parents, where instead of waiting for resources to come or the central government authorities appointing teachers, which is a huge headache, I saw it, I know how it's done, tapping onto the resources that might exist in the community, an expert in science, an expert in mathematics, so someone who's experienced with business, for example. I know many communities have business leaders. Tapping into that resources to bring them on board and allow students to learn from those practical experiences that are living among the community. Of course, this also requires a little bit of le uh, le um, leniency on policymakers to start seeing education as an ecosystem of communities uh, with schools and with teachers and principals. But I think this is something where high school or school principals can actively engage themselves with the community that they serve. Um, and I think there is no better resource available to any school anywhere than the parents and the families of the children that the school serves. It's lovely listening to you speak, actually. Um, parental engagement, actually the community engagement is something that we need to embrace as principals. Uh, I remember shortly before schools closed and there is this religious, uh, religious education in schools. And uh, my, my teacher was absent on that day, who would teach that. So I went, one of the community leaders is a pastor. And so I called him and he said, principal, I can actually come and offer free services for that lesson. And the pastor came to school and when he finished, guess what? My children said they'd rather be taught by the pastor than the teacher. There you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. It's possible. Thank, oh. you for, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Well, uh, sure. Okay, Ms. Amidi, my next question involves a little game. A quick round of rapid fire. I have a set of incomplete sentences, and I would like you to complete them with the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Amidi. Joy in the classroom looks like dash. Oh, wow. Laughter. Children's laughter. Nothing gives me more joy than children just laughing. Thank you. Next question. Children today need? Oh, my God. <laughs> Where do I even begin? <laughs> oh, I <think> please. <laughs> more than anything, I think children need guidance, proper guidance from adults. Question three, schools in the future need to? I think schools in the future need to really question the status quo, our history of why we have locked ourselves to the boundaries, the physical boundaries of a school and only consider that learning. Inside of a, a, a full world space. Great, you're doing well. Now <laughs> to the <Thank> last question. <laughs> to the last question. School leadership is? I think for me, school leadership is like parenting. And I know that's a very controversial thing to say because we don't want to take the right of parents away from parenting their children, particularly in war-torn and 
conflict areas where there's poverty, children don't have the luxury of spending uh, quality time with their parents because parents are always busy working and providing. And so school schools and school leaderships not only have the responsibility to teach, but they must also fill that responsibility of bear, being the caretaker, you know, providing the nurture and the love and the compassion and the care that parents do. And I don't want to shy away from the fact that it is the responsibility of schools to provide that. That was fantastic. Thank you for playing along. Uh, you. And now it's time for you to speak to many principals like me out there. If you were a principal today, what would you focus on? Any advice for all the school principals out there listening to this? I so dream and wish to be a principal again because I once was. Um, I think my challenge to all the principals is to, while you're fulfilling your duty as an administrator of a school, some schools are small, some schools are very large, we understand the dynamics. At the end of the day, you are an adult that all the children coming day in and day out are looking up to. If you want, the children of your school to grow up to become good citizens of the world, then you as the leader in their life at those moments while in school, you must embody the quality of a the quality of adults that you want to see, you must embody that in your body and in your action and in your words. Then I think every principle across the globe, is has the potential and the capability to be that wonderful role model that they can be. Wow, you must have noticed that I grabbed my pen and a notebook just to make sure I <laughs> scribble out. <laughs> Principal, we need to be wonderful role models. Well put, I think I can promise that when the term begins next year, that would be my driving factor. And Thanks. I hope to visit your school one day to see you in action as a principal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And of course, you see now you've started getting into my school because you are in the principal's office today. <laughs> oh, I sorry. I, I spoke I spoke out of bounds. Sorry, Mr. Principal. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mead is speaking with you it was an absolute pleasure. We are lucky to have people like you who think so deeply about leadership and its importance in building a future for children around the world. I cannot thank you enough for this conversation, Ms. Amedi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to more fruitful conversations, not just with me and you, but between principals and ministers and administrators and activists all around the world to, to change the future for billions of children across the globe who can be better citizens because of their educational experience. That's great. Thank you. To, to our what? viewers, sorry? I said, have a wonderful day. <laughs> wow. I'm sure now you will notice that it's not that bad. Occasionally, you're called into the principal's office for Good things. <laughs> thank you. You're a wonderful principal. So thank you for not, um, right. yeah, not scolding me. <laughs> to our viewers, thank you for joining us. As you listen to these conversations, let us know what you think is the leadership needed to build excellent schools. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. See you in our next episode of In the Principal's Office. Thank you and good day.